Welcome to Safe, Efficient, Profitable, a Worker Safety Podcast, where we break down real problems from real situations and discuss realistic solutions. And here's your host, owner of Allen Safety LLC and CHMM, Joe Allen. Good day. My name is Joe Allen. I'm the owner of Allen Safety. I've been reading about these podcasts and you're supposed to have a sponsor and say, we'd like to say something about them. We don't have any. So I guess Allen Safety is the sponsor. So there you go. I appreciate everyone listening in today. This is episode number three. And today we're going to be talking about some more about lockout tagout, more procedure driven. We'd also like to say a couple of housekeeping issues. Thanks again for Jen for setting all this up and coordinating this and trying to figure it out. And um, we're just trying on these next few episodes to get any of the kinks worked out. I've had some good feedback and I will always take feedback, positive or negative, because I just want to make the process run better. So what we do is we've got some, it's, uh, basically episode three here, we're going to talk about some of the procedures, how we walk through the floors, how we take some of the data we've had on the last couple of episodes and, and tie those into this. So the quick recap of episode one was, was looking at the floors, figuring out a plan, seeing what some of your risks are. Episode two is more of now we're going to start putting a gap analysis together of particular items such as lockout tag out. And then now we're going to be going into how do we manage the procedure side. Now, the reason we picked the procedure side to be episode three is that's where I see a lot of questions or confusion. So we thought we'd just address that. What makes us uh, today able to talk about this from some background, for those you don't know us, uh, we write thousands of procedures a year, and I will tell you they're not the most exciting thing to do, but they're a necessity and there is a reason to do it, and then they also tie into multiple other variables. They can tie into line break systems, or they can tie into confined space issues, or they can tie into other systems of how people do a particular process. So we just thought the procedure part we'd talk about. Um, I personally uh, like the procedure idea, but it, it, when you're looking at a scope of 500 or 1,000 or 3,000, it can easily become overwhelming, especially for someone who's trying to figure out the way they want to address it. So we're going to go over how I address these. All right, so the first thing we do is I would say, okay, now I figured out a gap and I have some procedure gaps. On these particular procedures, I need to put a plan together. What am I going to do with that plan? Well, the first one is I need to identify how many pieces of equipment I think I have. So I may look for a list that says I have 1,000 or 200 or 20 or whatever that number is. I try to get that list working on it or building it so I know how many procedures I need. And then I'm going to start taking pieces of equipment that I think through my walkthroughs that I think need more than one type of procedure. So maybe it needs a startup procedure and operation procedure when there's a jam, or maybe there's a maintenance side or a troubleshooting or something like that. So then I will start breaking that down. Okay, so how many versions of procedures or how many uh, addendums do I need for the procedure and how am I gonna manage that? Now, for example, I may have a procedure that I'm gonna write that's gonna be how to lock out equipment number one, and then, I decide I'm going to bring a contractor in because we've decided as a management team that it's really more of a, of a risk for us to manage whatever this piece of equipment is and how we want to work on it. So we decide to hire a contractor. As we hire the contractor now, now I've got to be thinking about is the contractor's way they're going to lock it out different than I would. So I may have another variable added with that as well. So now I could have multiple variables of a procedure. So now how do I break this down? I could have a contractor one. I could have like a third shift one that's different contractors that come in, or I can have a maintenance or troubleshooting ops. I can manage that any way I want to manage it, but I've got to break that down. So now I've got the procedure and now I've got to decide, okay, how many do I want to do? Well, one of the things I want to do is I want to get my list start writing my format of my procedure. Now my format of my procedure, there's all different kinds of programs you can buy or upload or whatever you want to do or create your own. Um, Allen Safety, we, I personally don't like writing in the traditional way where you put them on a computer, you take a picture, you bring it back. It's a lot of time for me. And one of the things I think that most locations have trouble with and struggle with is time. They don't have the time to get the procedure done. So even though the procedure is important, 
what I've noticed over the last few years is the person who has the knowledge and experience to write the procedure correctly has two or three other jobs or the scope of their job is very intense. The person who has the time to write the procedure and organize it correctly doesn't have the skill set or knowledge to put the data in correctly. So it becomes this gap in the middle of just the procedure world. And that's where I spent a lot of my time the last few years is how do we get the data out and the information real time in a timely manner and then also get the information done correctly. Because what happens is there comes this, this weird thing about I have so many procedures to do, I almost just stop and I don't get any of them done. Or I have to validate so many of them and it becomes an overwhelming process when there's all the other job functions that we're doing also for our normal, normal job that we're assigned to do. So how am I going to do this now? So now I'm going to take the procedures and I'm going to try to figure out, okay, I need a procedure to do equipment number one. I'm going to see how many pieces of equipment look like number one. So if I've got seven pieces of equipment that look like number one, I'm going to try to write that one because then I feel like I'm almost getting seven of them done and mentally it makes me feel better. I don't have a thousand to write. Maybe I have seven less to write with the timer at one. Now, I'm not saying they can't be a little different, not saying they are or not. And I can always tweak the procedure or add another one. But when I'm writing from scratch or writing a blueprint and I'm saying there are 14 things I need to do for this lockout procedure, I've tried from a time management standpoint, pick the ones that are multipliers first. So at least if I'm tweaking it or adding it, I'm getting more done off the bat and it makes me feel more confident that it's not so overwhelming the way I'm doing now, the next thing I'm going to do is now I'm going to make sure that each one of those is as similar as they can be. If it disconnects differently, absolutely, I take some different pictures. Um, now, I do like pictures. Um, the reason I like pictures is most of my locations have multiple language or multiple people from different parts of the world. I just taught a, a class a few weeks ago, and when I was teaching that class to management teams, that class had seven different people from different countries around the world that had moved to America and were working at the location. I'm training this management group with say 12 people in the class and most of them are from multiple different countries. So they may or may not speak English as well. It may be harder for me to get the concept of what I'm talking about, how to translate it. I don't want that miscommunication in a lockout procedure. I want it to be very easy. So I'm a very much a picture-oriented person when it comes to lockout. If you were ever around me and saw me write a lockout procedure, I want the picture. I want the picture of what the equipment looks like, and I want the pictures of the main um, uh, way to turn off or control that hazard. I do not want, though, the picture of the actual disconnect on the wall, and that's it. Because I would rather have the picture about 10 feet away of seven disconnects and put an arrow to the one or make sure the label's clear so they can see it. Because I've had trouble with, well, people will try to follow a procedure. And then when they do that, the next thing you know, they lock out the wrong disconnect because they just think it's one and they don't see that it's one of seven on a wall. So that's what I'm looking for. So I'm looking for how many like and kind of items, how many of them have like a, a disconnect, picture driven and then making sure I can find it when I go out. I want this to be able to any person that we say, yes, you can do it is good to go. Now, the other thing I want to do is I want to create the procedure in a way that I can do it over and over because I may be doing a thousand of them. So the methodology or the hours, I've actually will sit down and say, okay, it's a thousand procedures. It's going to take me seven minutes to do one. I now have a labor cost of all the other things I got to do. How am I going to get these done in the next few months? So it could be on some of these a timeline longer than you would really think when you originally look at it because you're not calculating minutes. I'm all about minutes on these. How many minutes does it take to do the procedure? Walk out physically, take the pictures, come back, do the task, finish it, whatever it is. Now that I've decided that, now I've got a scope of how big the project is. Now I've decided to take the picture, and I'm fine. Now I'm going to write out the steps. Now I'm not talking about a computer system that says, you know, lock it out, remove the guard, or try. I, I, don't, I don't look at it that way. I look at it like piece of equipment one, 
how do I really lock it out? Where is the valve to lock out hydraulic? Where is the valve to do pneumatic? Where is the disconnect? Can I see it? Do I understand? And then how do I validate each one of those controls? I do not like the words try as the only word. I agree we have to try, but the try has been some of the events that I've worked has been the gap. So I'm more conscious about what is the try and how to physically make sure the try works. I'll give you an example. I lock out a gas line on a piece of equipment and there's one valve and I lock it out. How do I try that the gas is out of the rest of the piping of the valve? I lock out an airline. The airline, there's no rule about whether the airline is two foot or 500 feet. So I may lock out the airline and the procedure says try it and I push a button. Okay, I did it. But what? What if it should have been for two minutes? Because I actually time them. I know that sounds kind of weird, but I actually would go out there and I would say, all right, hit the try function on the air release. And I will pull out my, a stopwatch or phone wear and I will time how long it takes. Because in a lot of people's mind on a lockout procedure, they're thinking lock, move over another 30 seconds, lock this out, do this, do this, and I'm ready to go. It's wild when you think about some piece of equipment may take a minute or two to drain all of the hazard out of that particular piece of equipment. But that's what I want to know. Because if it does take that long, I'm going to write that in my procedure. As a note, it could take two minutes for the airline to come out, to drain completely out. Because people aren't thinking about that subconsciously. They're thinking, do something task, do something task. So that's, that's where I get it from there. So now as I finish that, now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to then take the information that we have from that, put it in a formalized process that looks standardized. I'm going to have a maintenance person take the first one I've done. Maybe it's the one that's seven-piece equipment. Maintenance person take it out who normally works that piece of equipment. I'm going to have them validate that it's correct. And then I go back to what I've talked about the last two episodes, end user, is that the way we do it? And I am now capturing that information for the first procedure of even how I'm going to do it. So now that I've figured out how I'm going to do it, now I have the process, now I can start looking at my multiplier. But back to my time, I do calculate the time it took for the maintenance or the ops or the end user's time because that's the real amount of minutes it takes for that procedure. And, and I know for some people, like we have lockout procedures or we have hundreds, we have thousands, we've had them forever. I'm not saying you do or don't. All I'm asking you is, I work a lot of events across the country and all I'm asking you to do is back up for a couple of minutes, take the procedure you have if you have it, see if it meets these different variables. If it does not have pictures, if the maintenance person does not agree, if the engineers doesn't agree, now you need to rewrite that procedure. You may find out when you go to do that that there's way more than one. And if you're going to do that, it's about how to manage your time and how you're going to move it going forward. All right, so then the last part is, now I've decided how many I've got, now I have the procedure, now I have the pictures, I'm great, and now I'm going to start doing it. Who's physically going to type it up? Because on some of these, like if Joe Allen's got to type one up, I don't type very fast. So the time for me to type it actually takes longer than me almost doing everything else. So I have to recognize that, that I may be an expert at that piece of equipment, but I'm not the expert at getting it done at the time of typing. So now I've got to factor in how to get that done. Now it's done. I take it out, revalidate it. I'm good to go. Now, does Joe Allen put their name as the only name on that procedure? I do not. I do not think that any procedure that you could hand to a person, whether it be an employee and or contractor, should only be one person saying it's correct. I think it should always be two people. I think it should be a maintenance and safety or maintenance and ops or safety maintenance ops or however you want to do it. Because there are places with the different structures that are set up that my responsibility may be to write those as a safety manager. But all I really am is the data collector and organizer. I'm not necessarily the subject matter expert and validating it's correct. It may be another process. So if I had that maintenance person validate for me, I, I have them write it on there that they validate it. If I have ops, I mean, if it's a supervisor, why can't they be part of it? Because to get a member, in about a year, somebody is going to have to have a revalidation of their lockout. And when they do that, if we talk about we did episode two where we pull the lockout procedure that they should be locking out the equipment for and we're revalidating it, 
We want to make sure that we were great the year before, not find some weird anomaly that we didn't know on the year of revalidation. We want all that information to be captured on the front end so that as we do it the following year, we're good to go. And it's more of like, okay, we did it. It's great. We followed procedure. It is correct. We're good to go move on. So that's where I get with the part of the procedures is look at your procedure, start getting a plan together, how many minutes it's going to take, figure out your process, and understand that it could take more than a few days. And what you have to do is you have to really look at the scope of this project. This one process, one project could take a lot of time. Now, in closing for that part, it's okay to have a new safety person or or an intern or someone like that. I'm asked all the time. Yes, they can write them. But I do not recommend that the such man expert, just like Joe Allen's not for me at Peace Equipment. I want to always have the people who are the experts be part of it, but the person who puts the data together can be someone else. But at the end of the day, it has to be validated by the experts for that area. I believe each location has expert people that know how to lock out that piece of equipment. We need to use them and their knowledge because they know it better than everyone else and they know real time. All right, so that's how that is for the procedure part as an overall perspective. Um, I appreciate you taking some time to listen today. Uh, we're going to do another lockout tagout episode four here and uh, next, and we'll cover some different things. But thank you for joining us this week. Stay positive. Anyone can get through anything with a positive attitude. And like I said, uh, Jen always tells me, don't forget to subscribe or uh, leave us some kind of review. I'm, I'm open-minded to do anything that people have to say because I believe in constantly improving. I think we can always make things better at Process Improvement Company. And then uh, to close with this, the safe, efficient, profitable, this lockout tagout, the reason I'm talking about time so much, it is a, is a control factor that can really go a lot of different directions. So let's stay focused on the path. Let's not get overwhelmed. Let's get our list together. Let's figure out real time we're going to do, and let's make it really, really successful for the business. And then it will start to manage itself if we do it all correct on the front end. So thank you again for listening in, and we'll talk to you next time. Have a good day. Thank you for listening to Safe, Efficient, Profitable, a worker safety podcast. If you like what you heard here, please take a moment to write us a quick review, like, subscribe, and share our podcast so that others can find us. For questions or to request topics that you'd like to hear on our next show, please visit us at www.allen-safety.com. Thank you.